All right, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the church's role with victims of trauma. And I will start with a story, which is not about a client. About 20 centuries ago, baby girls were considered, considered a liability, a hindrance. And in the first century, under the Roman Empire, in certain parts of the world, there was a huge imbalance between male and female. Killing baby girls was very common. They were considered deformed. And they were killed by exposure. So in essence, it was uh, permitted by law to take an infant girl and leave her outside on the city dung heap and let her die. So that's a pretty clear judgment of worthless, wouldn't you say? But also in the first century, there was a growing group of people who did not agree with that judgment. And rather than accepting the culture's assessment regarding the value of female, they went outside the city to the dung heaps to find and rescue abandoned baby girls. Their decision was risky because they were going against law and it was sacrificial. It required standing against the culture, making a judgment against what the culture was doing, and it obviously meant giving life and time and goods to someone else's baby girl. It meant extending the circle of their responsibility. It meant being devalued by the culture, because if baby girls were worthless and you treated them as important, then you were worthless too. But they decided that baby girls were precious. And so they entered into that and served them. Well, guess who these people were? They were the church. They were the church in the first century in the Roman Empire. And what they did was follow the lamb who went outside the city gates to also make a sacrifice and give his life for those who are worthless. That would be us. And by his death and life, he judged us precious. So that first century church followed him outside the gates to the garbage heaps to rescue baby girls. The call that was answered by our first century brothers and sisters is the same call that the church has today what I was talking about last night. It is the call of God as his body in this world to follow our head in his protection of the vulnerable and his tender care of the suffering. So how does a church do that? I'm going to give you some thoughts about that. <clears throat> and then I'm going to put you in your groups and make you figure some of it out. But what I would like to consider with you first before we do that, um, how many have read Counseling Survivors of Sexual Abuse? Okay, so for some of you this will be a quick review and for others of you, you probably need to read the book to really understand what I'm talking about. But there are three concepts in there when I'm talking about personhood people created in the image of God and what that means about who we are. And I think it's important for us to understand that just as much as it's important for us to understand trauma if we as a church are going to help. Um, it's important to understand what it means to be created in the image of God. Because otherwise it would be like, suppose when um, trains were first invented and somebody wanted you to see one of the first trains and how fast it could go and how beautiful it was and all the things it could do for people and they took you out somewhere and showed you a wreck 
Now, you've never seen a train before, and all you got in front of you was a wreck. You wouldn't really understand what the train was supposed to be like. Well, that's sort of what we're left with with human beings, right? Because we're all a wreck. And in a secular world, you'd have to try and figure out what a human being is supposed to be like working with the wreck. But from the scriptures, we are told what a human being is supposed to look like. And that very much changes the way that we think and work with people, I think. So I have three concepts that have arisen out of the work that I've done with trauma that I think express in a very partial way something of the image of God in us. The first is voice. And by that I mean that God created us in his likeness to be word. You know, he spoke us, he spoke the world into existence. His son is the word made flesh. And so human beings in the image of God are meant to be people who speak, who express, who create. So it's, it's words, but it's not just words. It's expressing emotion. It's expressing creativity. It's expressing art or music or all of those things. That's who we're meant to be. That's part of what God looks like. What trauma does is silence voice. And so particularly if you think about a child growing up <clears throat> incubated in sexual abuse, nobody wants to hear from them. They want them to be quiet. They want them to be abused and not say anything. And nobody wants to hear from them about how much it hurts or whether they want it or not or what the pain is like or anything like that. So it crushes something of the image of God. Trauma silences voice. It's important to recognize that when we work with people in counseling or in our churches because it's very easy to want to come in with word in a way that silences them. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The second thing, the second concept is relationships. You know, God is a triune God. He says, let us make man in our image. God pursues us for relationship. He pursues us in Christ for relationship. Christ had relationships here when he was on earth. Trauma severs relationship. Because you have deception, you can have a relationship with deception. You have shame. When we have shame, we hide from relationship. You have betrayal. The relationship is utterly broken when you have betrayal. And so when we are enveloped in trauma or grow up with trauma, we do not have relationship in the way that God meant for us to be. Which then means, especially if it's happening to a child, you grow up and you get married or you do whatever, but you don't have that sense of what the relational capacity is and what it's like to be known, seen, and loved all at the same time. Nobody, when you're being abused, bothers to know you. They certainly don't see you. They use you. And they certainly aren't loving you. So the concept of relationship, safe relationship, good relationship, is another key component that needs to be understood in responding to trauma survivors. The third one is power. And by that I mean just human's ability to have impact. You know, God said to Adam and Eve, rule and subdue. Those are power words. You know, Jesus says, go out and make disciples. Have an impact on the world. Turn it upside down. Um, you have choice, and you can choose to impact the world. So, again, you go back to the concept of trauma, whether it's a child or an adult. They're, they're powerless. Helplessness is part of the essence of post-traumatic stress disorder. You don't have a choice. If you think you have some in your mind, nobody listens to it anyway or cares about it, it's crushed. And so people who have been traumatized, and the more trauma there is, the more significant these impacts are, obviously, have been silenced. They don't know anything about safe relationship. And they don't know that they matter and can have impact. So when somebody comes into your church body who has a history of trauma, those things are present in them. And it is a very important thing to understand 
or you will relate to them as if they have voice, they understand safe relationships, and they know they have impact. And you'll, you'll miss them because you won't understand those things. So if we think about those concepts, and we also think about what you did in your small groups and how trauma impacts and what it teaches over the lifespan, you understand that people who've been traumatized often cannot respond or take in the things that we as a church typically do. Well, what do we do? We preach. We teach. We sit around in groups of people. And we want your impact to be what we suggest it ought to be. We don't want you to impact us with things like sexual abuse and domestic violence and all the things that have happened to you. And so, in many ways, the structure of the way we do church doesn't make room for trauma victims. Now, I happen to think that's quite wrong, which I suppose is obvious at this point. Not that those things shouldn't be done. Preaching is of God. Teaching is of Him. Relationships are of Him. But we also have to do those things in a way that allows for the fact that the statistics say one in three women. In my country, one in four women are sexually abused before they turn 18, and one in six men. Now you think about your church, and you think about counting off. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. When you preach and teach and do small groups and everything else, you're also talking to them. Or one, two, three, four, five, six, in terms of the males. One, two, three, four, five, six. We don't think about that in order to speak and teach and walk alongside in ways that can be received by somebody who does not know what it means to have a voice, who's never met a safe relationship, and thinks they're utterly helpless to have impact on anybody. So, one of the things that survivors need, survivors of trauma need when they come into your midst as a church, is safe relationships. So what I want you to do, I'm going to give you some things to go with this that I want you to discuss in your small groups. So under safe relationships, describe what that looks like. What words would you list to describe safe relationships? What barriers to those relationships might exist or should you expect from people who've been traumatized? How are they going to resist relationship and why? In the context of relationships, victims also need community. So not just this kind, but this kind. Again, you think about um, somebody who's been abused for a long time as a child. You think about a woman who's been isolated from everyone in her home while she's being battered and isn't allowed to have friends. They have no idea what community is. They don't know how it's supposed to function. What happens to community when a child is being perpetually abused? What happens to a refugee when they have to leave home? What happens to community? Or to a torture victim? Or someone who's a victim of rape in a large system that turns a blind eye and says the victim's the problem, you need to leave. We have to protect our organization. What happens to community when trauma is inflicted by a government? What does that do to community? Some of you come from countries where community has been profoundly impacted by trauma because of governments. So I want you to think about that. The church is a community and we want people to come in and we want them to feel safe and everything else. But some people don't know what community looks like. So I want you to think about what a community needs to be like in order to welcome trauma victims. Third, victims need to hear the truth. Why is that important, do you suppose? I mean, if you're going through trauma, you've got lies all over the place in your head. And how might we communicate that to them? 
And by that, I don't mean truth like you need to learn to have more faith in God and not be like that. Not that kind of truth. But people who speak the truth. Um, for those of you who are pastors, again, 42 years I've done this work, I can count on one hand the number of victims that have ever heard a pastor from the pulpit speak about child sexual abuse, rape, or domestic violence. Now, if you're a pastor, you've got all those things sitting in your pews. And I don't mean you have to do a lesson on it. It probably wouldn't be appropriate anyway. But they've never even heard it in a list of things that shouldn't be happening. And that if it is happening, it's wrong, and God hates it. So they think you know, and you're not saying, because it's OK. Many years ago, I had a woman who was head of a national women's ministry. And the book, Counseling Survivors of Sexual Abuse, had just come out. And she called me on the phone. And she said, I finished reading your book on the plane. And it's terrific. And I'm so glad you wrote it. And I'm so glad this isn't in my denomination. <laughs> so I said to her, do me a favor. You travel all over the country and you speak to women's groups and you stand up and you say, women, I know you struggle with parenting and you struggle with depression, some of you, or anxiety or a difficult marriage. Just throw into the list a history of sexual abuse. You don't have to say anymore. She called me several months later and she said, I don't know what to do. They're coming out of the woodwork. And it's because when somebody in authority even puts the word out there, that means they know it exists. And what that says to victims is, huh, I might be able to talk to that person. Because they believe this stuff happens, and they believe it's wrong. So that's part of truth-telling in churches. The other thing that I think we as Christians have lost, at least in many parts of the world, is how to lament. The evangelical community um, seems to have a great deal of difficulty with certain emotions, like grief, particularly if it lasts, uh, like anger, like fear. And I, I think that we often um, are uncomfortable with those things, and we deal with them by throwing a, a Bible verse at somebody, sort of like a little dart, you know? So somebody tells you they're angry at their perpetrator, and you say, be angry and sin not. You forget the part about the be angry, right? Or grieving. I mean, some people grieve for years over things. Sometimes you live with something and you grieve all the time because it never goes away. Well, you should be full of joy. Mm -hmm. I mean, so oftentimes we do that. Somebody who has a trauma history is full of fear, and we say, you know, God's not given us the spirit of fear. And those are the splat things. And part of what happens then is that communicates to the victim, this is not a safe place to tell my story. I can't be honest about who I am. And so they stay silent, and they sit in the pews, and nobody knows where they leave, and nobody knows why. So I think we need to learn how to lament as Christians. And I want to talk just a little bit about that, and then tomorrow we're going to do something with it more. But to lament means to express grief or sorrow or regret or disappointment. And trauma victims have a great deal of that to express. I think it's like 40% of the Psalms are laments. That's a lot. That doesn't count the prophets like Jeremiah and people like that. And we've lost the art. We want people to get over things quickly and move on. And we question their faith if they don't. When I went to um, Ground Zero, you know, uh, shortly after it happened to speak at a conference, uh, somebody had, some journalist had stood on the street corner and done a research thing, you know, and asked bypassers, um, how long do you think people should grieve such a thing? How long do you think people typically would grieve this kind of thing? Two weeks was the standard answer. Two weeks. 
So I want you to think about in your group, what might some of the losses and griefs be for somebody who was abused as a child, for a wife who was battered, for somebody who was tortured, who's a refugee? Let me just read a couple of scriptures that are part of lament. And I want you to put on your very evangelical head, not your trauma head, right? And you think about hearing these words in your church from someone and what you think the answer would be. My eyes failed. I have watched in vain for any help. God's wrapped up in a cloud and no prayer has ever gotten through of mine. God has made me scum and garbage. What would your church say? And it's right out of the scriptures. All my enemies are against me. I'm terrified. I have been devastated and destroyed and I cannot stop crying. What would they say? Or you think what kind of victim might say this and how would the church respond? I have been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies who had no cause. We have this thing about 50-50, you know, right? They flung me into a pit and threw, threw stones on me, water closed over my head, and I tell you, I am lost. Or what might some standard Christian responses be to this? I hate my life. I will give free utterance to my complaint and I am going to speak about the bitterness in my soul. What would you do if somebody in your church talked like that? Or why, God, does it seem good to you to oppress me? to despise me, and to favor the wicked? Or why did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I'd die before anybody had seen me. Every one of these things has been said by God's people and put in his word for us. But our typical response is to shut it up and find a verse that counteracts it. And one of the things that I fear is that just as trauma overwhelms its victims and affects their meaning making, affects their views of God, either shapes them based on lies or destroys what they were holding on to, what we're doing sometimes in response is hearing the trauma and it affects our beliefs. And what we tend to do is push back with creeds, which is what Job's friends did. Friends, right? Which God was not actually too pleased with. Because we have these creeds, you know, God is this, these things happen if you love him, so forth and so on. And then something happens, and it's like a bomb drop, got dropped on our beliefs. And sometimes the bomb is because somebody told us a story we can't fit into our creeds. And so we give them our creeds and hope they'll go away because we want to hold on to our creeds. But our creeds are a finite, extremely limited, probably not always right, expression about the God behind the creeds. And if we let it, not just as individuals in this room, but as whole bodies in churches, the bomb dropped on our creeds will change us. God is pursuing us when our beliefs don't fit right. And he is wanting us not to throw up walls to people's laments or questions or suffering. He wants us to enter in and let it pick at our creeds or completely destroy them because if we do not believe about God in ways that allow for sexual abuse and ouspitch and anything else you can think of, we don't really know him. We don't really know him. So 
as you work with some of these questions in your groups, you're going to struggle with them. Or maybe you'll struggle with some anger towards your church because you know what they would do. But the question is not just how would you respond to trauma victims in a church community so that they have a voice and experience safe relationships and understand that they have impact, all the while being able to bring their trauma story into the midst of everybody and be heard and be cared for and be safe. So what would that look like in your church? And they, then as you do that, what I would like you to do as you look, work through some of those questions is think about your particular church. What, from what you're thinking today, what would, just a small thing, it doesn't have to be a big thing, and I'm not talking about a complete overhaul, those things never work anyway. What would you want to take back to your church as one thought or question or suggestion that might open the door to people of influence in the church beginning to think some of these things through so that they might become welcoming places for trauma victims to tell their stories and find healing? So just think about one thing you might want to do. And then think, what's going to stop me? What will the obstacles be? Leadership isn't going to care. I'm afraid and I don't want to do it. Whatever. But think about what you would like to take back and what the obstacles might be. Okay. I want you to go into your groups. And I'm going to run through these questions again really quick so somebody jots them down because I don't have them on a handout. So the first one is, describe what safe relationships look like for trauma victims. And then what barriers would you expect in a church community to those safe relationships? And then community. You know, the whole thing about church is community, which is a good thing. But what happens to community when somebody's never had one? Or what happens, what kind of feeling is someone going to have about community who walks into a church where everybody knows everybody and they just swam to shore as a refugee and they don't know anything about this country or how to get along or what church is like here or anything like that. What is community supposed to look like so that it doesn't close its doors but it is like this? So describe what it needs to be like so that it welcomes trauma victims. And then truth-telling. What's that like in your church? Do people name things in your church? Or do they not name the unnameable things? And how might you carefully, wisely, by prayer, begin to push on that a little bit? And then lament. How does your church treat grief and sorrow that isn't in a neat package? Is there space for that? Has your church ever done corporate lament? Will you take some of the scriptures of lament and lament on behalf of those in your midst who have been wounded? So how, how does your church respond to things like grief and loss, or what might, how might your church respond if some of the scriptures I read were said in a way that expressed the trauma victim's feelings, but didn't sound so exactly like scripture that people didn't recognize what they were hearing. You know, I wish I had never been born. So, what would your church do with that? And then, one thing that you might want to think prayerfully about saying or doing to just poke a hole a little bit, to get a toe in the door. It could be with just a small group, it could be with leadership, it could be anything in between. But just think that through, and what obstacles am I likely to encounter?